Mammals, like almost all other types of animal today, used to lay eggs, but then they adapted to give birth to live young. Mammals didn't just used to lay eggs, and actually some of them still do today, because mammals aren't defined by giving birth to live young, it is just that the overwhelming majority of mammals that survive to the present day live this way. So why did some mammals make this change, and if it has been so beneficial, why haven't more animals evolved to do it? All animals that give birth to live young, known as viviparous animals, have descended from animals that lay eggs, or viparous animals. However, not all egg-laying animals are made equal. The shape and chemical composition of the egg membrane varies wildly, as does their behaviour. The oviparous creatures that mammals evolved from are known as the amniotes, which are animals like birds, reptiles and mammals. The amniotes evolved from animals that looked like amphibians that lived around 300 to 350 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. These animals would have laid eggs that looked a lot like frog spawn, which have to be laid in the water. This meant that they were tied to the water for their reproduction cycle, which was the largest restriction to these animals wandering and settling further inland. The amniotes first evolved in the Carboniferous period in response to this problem. They adapted to lay eggs that have an extra membrane named an amnion that allowed the eggs to retain more moisture so they didn't dry out, and allowed the embryos to exchange gases and chemicals in the air, instead of the water. The amniote ancestors that went on to give rise to the mammals were named the synapsids, that had already evolved and split away from the early proto-reptiles that lived at this time as well. The earliest known synapsid was named Archaeothyrus, that still had many reptilian features. However, over time, more and more synapsid species adapted to look more like mammals developing features like warm-bloodedness, fur and whiskers, among other things, as early as the end of the Permian period around 250 million years ago. However, the one trait that hung on a lot longer was laying eggs. A family of a creature named Caentotherium is known from Jurassic Arizona that consisted of an adult and a litter of 38 infants, considerably higher than any mammals today. Caentotherium lived around 180 million years ago alongside the dinosaurs. It wasn't a true mammal, but was very closely related. Due to the sheer size and positioning of the brood, they must have recently hatched from eggs, which means at least some synapsids were still laying eggs over 100 million years after they first appeared, and indeed still are today, as monotremes, animals like platypus and echidna, still lay eggs to this day. Finding the first animals that gave birth to live young is difficult because usually the organs involved with pregnancy don't fossilise very well. But we know that marsupials and placental mammals last had a common ancestor around 160 million years ago in the mid-Jurassic period, and since both of these groups are viviparous, their common ancestor must have been also. So mammals that didn't lay eggs must predate this. And although there is currently no direct evidence, there are a group of prehistoric mammals that are very good candidates as the first mammals to give birth to live young, the multituberculates. Multituberculate fossils show they have very small pelvises, similar to marsupials, so they may have reproduced in a similar way, in giving birth to very undeveloped young that they then look after outside of the womb. It can't be known by the fossils if multituberculates had pouches or not, but it is at least unlikely they had all the adaptations that modern marsupials have to rear young this way. Despite not making it to the present day, the multituberculates are actually more closely related to marsupials and placental mammals than they are to monotremes. They were the most successful group of mammals that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, and they actually survived the mass extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs, but then went extinct around 25 million years later. So why did mammals switch to giving birth to live young if mammals and proto-mammals laid eggs for over 100 million years and got on fine, and some mammals still lay eggs to this day? Well, eggs and live birth, like many adaptations, have advantages and disadvantages. Eggs, especially unprotected, are vulnerable to the elements, or to predatory animals wanting to steal them. And although some animals, like birds, protect their eggs, this means they can't move around as freely. The mother is restricted in where they can move. The downsides to live birth is that although it provides more protection, it makes pregnancy longer and means that the eggs can't be abandoned in an emergency, putting more stress and risk on the mother. This is why live birth has evolved many times in other individual species and groups of animals, like some lizards, snakes, sharks and scorpions, despite nearly all of these species having close relatives that lay eggs or even egg laying being the norm for most of the members of the groups. 
However, mammals are unique in live birth being almost unanimous across the whole group. One theory of why this might be is that mammals didn't change to giving birth to live young, but that there was a shift of their whole reproduction strategy that made evolving this way considerably more likely or favourable. K. Entotherium's litter of 38 is substantially higher than any living mammals, being more similar to the size of a reptilian egg clutch. Although there are exceptions, the reproduction strategy among most reptiles is just to leave their young to fend for themselves once hatched, but make up for this by just laying many many eggs to ensure that at least some of them will survive. K. Entotherium shows that very large litter sizes are an ancestral trait inherited by all amniotes that mammals evolved out of. Other animals that have evolved live birth as well, like lizards for instance, have similar sized litters to their close relatives that still lay eggs. The skulls of K. Entotherium's offspring, while significantly smaller, were proportionate to adult skulls in shape, which is similar to the reptiles, and completely different to modern mammal skulls that change and mature as the animals get older to accommodate brain development. It is theorised that it was necessary for mammals to reduce their litter sizes in order to accommodate for the evolution of larger brains. The smaller litter sizes of mammals would naturally create a selective pressure for more care and nurturing of their young, as they have fewer offspring to survive if something was to go wrong. This would make live birth especially beneficial among mammals compared with other animals. When K. entotherium existed is around when the monotremes split from the rest of the mammals, with genetic evidence showing that they diverged from the other mammals either in the very late Triassic or the very early Jurassic, around 200 million years ago, and then have managed to cling on since then in Australia, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Monotremes have adapted and evolved a lot in the past 200 million years, but the way they reproduce doesn't seem to have changed very much. This is because although they lay eggs like reptiles and other animals, the way in which it is done is completely different. They produce very few eggs, with platypus only producing a clutch of about 1-3 to three eggs, and echidnas only really laying one egg at a time. Although platypus lay their eggs in specific locations like other egg laying animals, echidnas actually keep their egg in a pouch and carry them around with them. The yolk section of the monotreme egg is much thinner than a bird or a reptile egg, and so the offspring hatch very undeveloped but are then fed with milk while still in the pouch. Monotremes don't even have teats, like placental mammals and marsupials, and instead the milk oozes from their skin, where it is licked by their pups. It does the job, but it is less efficient, and other mammals have adapted to improve the efficiency. So the way monotremes reproduce is almost like a surviving example of how ancient mammals would have reproduced, so they offer clues into how mammals transitioned away from laying eggs. It seems reasonably easy to see how an animal like an echidna that already carries and hatches its eggs in a pouch could evolve into a marsupial-like animal by the eggs just hatching before they have left the body. But there is a major issue to overcome for this seemingly simple transition to take place, an issue that is solved by the development of a placenta that isn't for transporting food or energy to the fetus, because the babies would still be able to get food from a yolk sac. Initially, the most important job of the placenta was actually to exchange gases, supplying oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. An egg's outer membrane is used to diffuse oxygen from the atmosphere and get rid of carbon dioxide produced by the fetus, and both of these become impossible while contained in a uterus. Out of the other individual groups of animals that have evolved live birth, nearly all of them have convergently evolved placentas to solve this issue as well, even scorpions. Interestingly, with some of these lizards, the job of the placenta is only to provide oxygen, and they get all of their nutrients from a yolk sac. A highly modified version of the yolk sac these lizards would have used when they laid eggs. Placental mammals, like the viviparous lizards, also have a yolk sac, that are left over from the days when they laid eggs, only they are used very little throughout the pregnancy. In fact, for a long time it was thought that the yolk sac was vestigial, but it is now known that it does perform functions in the very early stages of pregnancy. It is likely that yolk sacs played a bigger part when mammals first stopped laying eggs, and like some species of lizards, the placentas may have only been used for oxygen transportation in the beginning. So baby animals could have got energy and food via a yolk sac before the development of a placenta. However, how they would have been able to exchange gases without one for the transition to take place is currently unknown. Manta rays, like many species of shark, give birth to live young. However, unlike sharks, they have no placenta or umbilical cord, and are one of the only known viviparous animals to not have one. 
They get oxygen through gulping the oxygenated uterine fluid that surrounds them through their gills in a similar way to sharks and rays that form inside eggs. So there are living examples of animals that give birth without a placenta. However, it is hard to draw comparisons with mammals because this is only possible due to the manta rays having gills. Although the initial importance, and most likely the reason for the evolution of the placenta was to exchange gases, a complex placenta was also a very important milestone for our ancestors to cross because allowing for active exchange to happen between mother and fetus meant that gestation periods could become much longer for placental mammals. Despite the name, placental mammals and marsupials both have placentas. Marsupials just have to give birth to their young very early because the placenta isn't complex enough to protect the embryo from its mother's immune system. However, marsupials aren't primitive, and their pouches, coupled with other things like having very nutritious milk, are answers to solving the issue of birthing very helpless young. Whereas the placental mammal's answer to this problem was adapting to increase the gestation period through developing a more complex placenta, but also losing bones in their torso that allowed more room for the fetus to develop. So mammals don't need to give live birth in order to be a mammal. In the past they laid eggs for several million years, and of course a very small amount of them still live this way to this day. But the culmination of the many mammalian features that slowly developed made giving birth to live young considerably more likely. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.